Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Back to you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello and welcome to another great episode here at IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Wes Bryan, and in today's episode, what are we doing? Well, we are bringing you some of that Microsoft Exchange online. And, well, joining us back in the studios, you know him, you love him, you want some more of him, Mr. Adam Gordon. Adam, how are we doing today, sir? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing good. How about you? Oh, you know, out of all the things I've lost, you know, I miss my dad the most. Help me out. Um, I was going to go with something else, but okay, that works. <laughs> if you miss your data, you should probably go find it. That's right. <laughs> we have we have solutions for that. Now. Very good. Uh, you could tile it. You could load jack it. That's right. Oh, you could share it system. with somebody who will remind you of where it is when uh, when you lose. Set it in front of the "you are here" sign in the mall, you know, and just leave it Do there. That? Cool, man. Free data, anybody who wants it to a good home. <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, so we're going to continue our conversation. You've been joining us up until now. Hopefully, you've been keeping up with us. You know we've been in the compliance management feature, taking a look at various elements. Uh, we've talked about auditing. We've talked about journal rules so far. We're jumping around a little bit on the tabs, dealing with some of the baseline functionality that helps us to understand what activities are going on and how we record those so that we have the ability to drive our governance, our risk management, our compliance activities. And we're going to continue there working through the, the middle tier of those features. We're going to start looking at data loss prevention. And then as we get done with that, we're going to break this conversation into two parts, by the way. Uh, we're going to have this episode, which is tag data loss prevention EAC, really just focusing on the elements of data loss prevention available to us in the Exchange Admin Center. Uh, and then we're going to have another episode right after this one, Data Loss Prevention, O365 Security and Compliance, because this feature, like many of the others in the security area, is split uh, between the EAC and split between the O365 Security and Compliance Center, where we're seeing a lot of that functionality migrate, move, and or reside formally now over time. And we've covered this idea of the split, this dichotomy between these features and where they reside. In some of the other episodes already, we've pointed out that we have auditing capabilities, for instance, right, in both. Uh, and so this is something to consider. So I thought it was good if we break this discussion into those two parts. But then as we get done, we're going to flip over and take a look at in-place hold e-discovery and ultimately retention policies will round out our conversations and compliance management there. So join me here. We're going to be focusing on the EAC. We're in compliance management. I know it's a little small, a little bit hard to see, zoomed out compared to where we normally start, but there's a reason for that. I'm going to zoom in in just a moment and show you where we are. But one of the problems we have sometimes, as you've heard me say uh, in some episodes, is when we zoom in and start at about 100% uh, in terms of the zoom factor in the web browser, we lose some functionality in the sense I have to navigate around to see things. And this is one of those cases where when I zoom in, you can't see everything easily. So I wanted to start it zoomed out, and I want to then just use our Zoom It feature to be able to show you what we're doing so you could get the overview of what's going on here. So let me just zoom in. You could see we're in the Exchange Admin Center right there, and we're in Compliance Management on the left in our feature navigation, and we're in Data Loss Prevention on our tab, as I suggested we would be. And we see our yellow indicator there. It says, hey, we can now have... DLP functionality through O365 Security Compliance. It says a single DLP policy. And what it does is it calls out that we can manage SharePoint One Drive and Exchange. Uh, Teams is not listed there, but Teams is now part of that management capability as well. Uh, we're going to leave that, as I said, for the next episode, just taking note of it here. Uh, but what we're going to do is focus on the DLP capabilities that we do have available to us still. And you can see right here that I have a DLP policy already created, DLP EOL test one that I've spun up in the portal. Uh, you could see our plus sign on the toolbar there indicating we can add and create policies. We'll take a look at how to do that. We could edit an existing policy. We could delete an existing policy, just going left to right with the tools. We also can work on uh, managing policy tips, one of the blue indicators and links right above us there. There's a tool for that. And then we have what looks like a little page with maybe some bars on it, right to the left of the recycle arrows to refresh. That gives us reporting and metrics, which is a little bit uh, of a disappointment, to be honest with you. Here in the EAC, the reporting on data loss prevention is really top-notch in the O365 center in terms of what we see there. It's a little bit wonky and hard to work with here. It's kind of a holdover and a legacy for this functionality. 
Uh, so we'll talk a bit about that and just my concerns about it and my recommendations to you after we go through the idea of how we set a policy up and what it does. All right, so let's just zoom out for a moment. Now that you've seen this and you could see our detail area around the existing policy right over here, kind of telling us what's going on, noticing that under policy mode, under enforcing, we have some links that allow us to specify how we may want to test this policy. And I just wanted you to see those before we move in and make everything a little bit bigger, easier to work with, but also a little bit harder to see some of that functionality and some of those things. You see I'm zooming in. It contracts everything a little bit. All right, so what I want to start out with is I want to go ahead and point out that our policy is currently, as we set it up, uh, on. And you can see the check mark in the box under the on column on the left there under the name, indicating the policy is active. And we could see mode is enforcing. So just visually, we can look and see this policy is indeed doing its job. I'm going to demonstrate that to you with a hands-on uh, little foray into email here in a minute. We're going to send some Social Security number, shame on us for doing that, by the way. We're going to send some Social Security numbers, and we're going to see what DLP is capable of doing uh, for us. And we can see that it seems that we have some matches that have already hit this policy, and indeed they have because I've already done this exact demo prior to starting the episode with you. But we're going to replay it so you can see the impact of what this means. And then we'll take a look at how to create policies and talk about the elements associated with them. So what I'm going to do is to switch over to our Windows 10 virtual machine where we're running the Outlook client as a full mappy desktop client. You've seen me do this in some of the other demos. I'm logged in as IT Pro TV4, so just a standard normal user, not the O365 guy user, although I have OWA up and running uh, for O365 guys, so we could certainly take a look at it there as well. Uh, but what I'm showing you now, and I'm gonna zoom in on this so you could see it for a minute before I create this capability again. I've already sent social security numbers via an email prior to the demonstration and prior to the episode starting. And DLP has kicked in and said, oh, hey, wait a second, you're not supposed to do that. And as well, I've created as part of the policy that I shouldn't do that, but has also blocked those SSN numbers because that's what the DLP policy is doing and has notified me as the sender that I've made a mistake and has done that. And so let's zoom in and just take a look, then I'm gonna show you how this is actually happening. You could see here I have an Outlook message that came in, and that Outlook message is from the postmaster, meaning it's from the Exchange Online system that's monitoring and keeping track of DLP. And it says message blocked. Uh, SSN numbers are here is just what I used as the subject for my message. And the little message here is saying, hey, stop your attempt to send protected Pi for shame with a little unhappy frowny face is the message that I created that I put in as O365 guy when I set this up to tell people they shouldn't do this, right? We want to look stern and wag our finger when we say for shame. But notice also the original message is right up there embedded in the block notification telling me not just that I made a mistake and I did something violated the policy, but the actual message that I sent out is there. That's the blue rectangle. And I could click on it and see the message if I wanted to. Uh, it's got the original information there, the social security numbers uh, in line there that I tried to send out. These are fake, just generic data that we use for testing. They're not real, but you can see uh, that I did try to send them. And you'll see I sent them to both my alias O365 guy, and I also sent them outside the organization to me at my itpro.tv address. That's the CC Adam Gordon line. It just translates to my name, but it's really the Adam at itpro.tv address you've seen me use. And as a result, I tripped the um, DLP policy that says, hey, you can't send this stuff outside the organization. And it clamped down and blocked that message. And it was never received by my external Adam at itpro.tv uh, email address or inbox because I never sent the message, even though I tried to. DLP blocked it and prevented it from actually being sent out. So I want to show you this in real time as we get started to let you see how this actually happens. So let's create a new mail message. And let me just go over here. Go to new mail message. And we're essentially just going to reproduce what we just did. So I'm going to specify that I want to send this to 0365 guy. There I am. We'll put myself in there. There's Adam at itpro.tv. So we'll just put that in there. We could put Wes at itpro.tv in there too, just for uh, extra capabilities. Just put a little uh, subject line on here. 
here are the SSN numbers we discussed, right? You know, something like that. Of course, discussed is not spelled with an N, so that's probably why that's not going to work the right way. You know, I am dangerous, but I'm not dangerous when it comes to spelling. I am dangerous if I can have a <clears throat> thought control. That's actually my, my take on technology. I don't want voice control. I just want to be able to think it and have it happen. I want thought-controlled capabilities because then I could just, you know, become that big brain you see on, like, Star Trek, old Star Trek episodes. Oh, yeah. Be that guy with the big brain. And I just, I could be like a floating head. Cool. Right. Yeah, you know, let me ask you a question really yeah. while you're typing that message out. Did it highlight those those areas in that message so that part of the policy, it's showing you uh, the highlighted uh, Social yes. Security numbers yes, there? That's that. that's interesting. That's so let me, I've just got that data, by the way. So just nice. go back to where we are. I'm just, I'm copying the data from the same message in, right? I'm just putting it back in so we can trip the rule again. So I've just got it pasted into the uh, notepad here just so I have it. So I'm just going to paste it into the body of the email. So I don't have to type it all out again and you know, obviously reproduce it. Uh, but the message specifically has social U.S. social security numbers in it. Uh, and you could see they're in the appropriate form in terms of the numbers and in the proper form they are. Uh, and so as a result, it will trip the filter uh, in the template for the DLP rule that says, hey, we're looking for one of them, USN or U.S. social security numbers. Now, the minute I started doing this, notice in blue at the top here, there's a policy tip, right? And the policy tip says, forget about the 0365 guy X right above that is what I'm talking about, the blue policy tip. It says in some sort of text, and again, I've typed this out and created this policy tip as part of the DLP policy. Uh, as a note to somebody who's attempting to send something that is about to be a problem, we have this ability to notify them if they choose to pay attention. We're going to ignore it, but if we choose to pay attention, this message appears to contain sensitive information. Make sure all recipients are authorized to receive it. So a policy tip is really just a notification, right, that we can use that tells people, hey, you may want to rethink what you're doing. We can ratchet that up a notch and actually have policy tips that do more than just say something. We can actually force the user that's about to send to opt in and to have to acknowledge by hitting a button that they know what they're doing is potentially an issue and that they even may have to be forced to write a business justification. A little uh, text box shows up and says, hey, why are you doing this? And unless you type something in and hit submit and override it, we're not going to allow you to even get out of the gate here, right? So policy tips can be a little bit more prescriptive and a little bit more action-oriented than what I'm showing you here. But the idea of integrating them into DLP is one of the features that we have. And we really want to think about as we look at DLP, because the more guidance and the more steps in the process we insert for users to interact with before we just let them hit send without thinking about the fact that it's a really bad idea to send personally identifiable or customer identifiable information like account numbers, like social security numbers, like bank routing numbers, whatever those things may be. Uh, outside of the organization, maybe even internal, inside the organization, or both, without really thinking about it and having to stop and consider it. Because it's so easy for us, just throw that stuff in there and hit send and not really even consider what we're doing. And that's often how breaches are occurring. People have the best of intentions, but they're acting in ways that they're not really thinking through. And if they just stopped and thought about it, they probably would do something different. So policy tips really give us that opportunity to apply a set of, think of them as speed bumps, right? Kind of bumps in the road that we have to slow down for. We don't want to stop the process. We want to slow you down enough that you may actually think about what you're doing. And if we make those policy tips interactive, force you to really consider if this is the best course of action. So that's one of the elements of DLP we'll be focusing on as soon as we get done with the demo. All right, so I wanted you to see this. Let's go ahead, let's send this. Okay, so that goes out. And now uh, it's making its way through the system. And in the next minute or two, because it doesn't just happen right away, there it is, 30 seconds, not even, uh, we get back, right? And you could see the note of go, uh, I just have notifications in my um, system. So it's just showing me, right, that they're there as well. But basically this notification block is the same as this email, right? So I'm just getting that. But you could see it tells me the same exact thing we just saw. Hey, you know, same message for shame, right? Same embedded message, right? You could see there that it's embedding it and saying, hey, you know, these things should not have been allowed to go out. All right, so this is a live demo of what DLP is actually capable of doing, driven by our policy. So now that we have a frame of reference for what we can do, let's go back and actually see how we implement that. So we're going to take a look at that policy. 
Now, I do have two data loss prevention policies running in the system. I have one in 0 through 65 compliance that we'll see in the next episode, and I have the one that's here in exchange. So we're just going to focus on this one right now and talk about this. Now, policy tips, like I suggested to you, can actually be created once we have the policy in place or even prior to them. You'll notice we have that link right up at the top, and we'll take a look at that after we look at the policy. So I'm going to highlight our policy. It is already highlighted. Double click or click the uh, pencil to edit in the toolbar just to show you some of the elements associated here. And then we'll go through and take a look at how to create one. So we have a name for it, pretty straightforward. The description comes from the fact that I chose a template that is already existent as opposed to creating a custom policy. So that description is pre-written in the template. If you choose a custom policy, there's nothing there. you got to figure it out for yourself. So that's up to you. But we're not really too concerned about that. You could see here, choose the state of this policy. Out of the box, we can enable or disable it. I showed you ours is on, but we can obviously modify that. Uh, and you see, choose a mode for the requirements in this DLP policy. Are we enforcing? And we do see on the right-hand side in the column under the policy that it is enforced. Uh, but we could also set it up in test mode with or without our policy tips. So I could dry run what I just did as a demo and test it to make sure the policy tip fires, that people do have to opt in, they have to override, they may have to write a business justification, whatever the policy may call for before I put this out and actually have it start up live. Now, I often talk to customers and students about this and I suggest to, you, to them, and I'm real, I really feel strongly about this in the real world, that you never deploy complex solutions like DLP live without testing, because you just don't understand the full nature of this system until you've seen it work. And when I say test it, I mean beat on it, try to violate it, but also try to comply with it and make sure both sides of that equation are working and make sure your reporting around that is working. And that's going to be important because reporting data is going to typically lag by 24 hours in the 0365 Compliance Center based on your timeline. So you're not going to see evidence of what you're doing right away. And you've got to give it time to run through the test cycles to understand what you're doing. In exchange, in the EAC, if you are actually going through and using just the little metrics we could see in the dashboard there, again, you're going to see data, but it takes a little time to aggregate and show up once you run your tests. So you got to bank on that, and you got to plan for that. You can't just say, hey, let me go do what I just did, right, that little hands-on demo, and then I'm good. It fired off. Everything's good. I don't have to worry about looking at the data. Yes, you have empirical evidence at work, but you probably want to run 5, 6, 7, 10, 12 or more tests on different sides of that, and then give it 24 hours to aggregate, see the reported data, make sure it's showing up, look at your audit logs, make sure you're seeing evidence of who did what, as we talked about in the auditing episode, and make sure all that's coming together so all those pieces are aligned before you decide this is actually the way you want it to work and that it is legitimately going to be good. It's very, very important to think about. All right, so we have all that. Now, the other thing I want to show you right down here, thank you, Taylor, is this little blue info item where it says all users within the scope of DLP policy must be licensed on either an e-exchange uh, online plan, an e uh, plan or excuse me, an EOP plan too is what I'm trying to say, level two, or have Exchange Enterprise CALS. Uh, this is a feature DLP that is not available to all Exchange Online plans. And you want to make sure that you have either the plan for level two if you're doing just Exchange Online standalone. We talked about this in some of the very early episodes in the show uh, because there is an EOL Exchange Online as well as an EOP Exchange Online protection capability that exists separate from Office 365 with Exchange Integrated. So there's different ways you could set this up. And so you need to have the premium level plans to include DLP. We're using an E5 tenant, and that does have the Exchange Online protection capabilities like DLP associated with it. So just be aware of that. If you go to do this and it doesn't work, probably means you don't have the licensing, but you can always upgrade if necessary to get that going. And then the rule piece is where we really see the magic happen. This is where we're able to go in and decide that we either want to create rules from scratch, as you can see, create a new rule and then use some of the built-in stuff. You'll see I have a rule there that says US SSN laws allow override. I have some other ones that are doing various things. But then I can also notify a sender when sensitive information is sent outside. You saw that we did that. I could block a message with sensitive information. You saw we did that unless we override or unless we have a business justification, as I was suggesting. So we have different options here that we can go in and create. And each one of these rules, 
as you can see, has a check mark, meaning they're all currently active inside the DLP policy. The policy is really just the container, right, that holds all the rules and the activities that are used to filter. And then those rules are what we assess against as we apply the policy. Uh, we talked about this and the same setup, the same idea, right? Uh, when we broke down and talked about spam filtering and we broke down and talked about malware filtering and the protection uh, feature. If you haven't seen those episodes, depending on how you're watching, what order you're going in, uh, either go watch them or if you've seen them already, you might remember that we talked about the fact that in the EAC, we create the policy and the rules are associated automatically through the wizard kind of as a one-stop shop. But when I went through and did those things in PowerShell and broke down those activities, we created the policy container first, and then the rule that binds the policy and applies it is created as a separate element, and those two together are what make that element show up in the EAC as we look at our malware filters or our spam filters being listed. So we need to understand the logic of that because that's a repetitive idea, the idea that the policy and the rule exist together as elements that are created and that we must have the container and then the elements that are actionable in order to make the solution work. And whether we create them all together in one place or we create them as two separate elements through PowerShell and combine them, the outcome is the same. And so this is, again, something we see over and over and over again. We want to make sure we're thinking along those lines, seeing that with clarity and understanding how that impacts our decisions around planning and implementation, right? All right, so just be aware of that. So we see here that we have an existing policy. Let's go ahead and let's create one because that's really going to show us what we need to do. So I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to quickly zoom in and show you when I click the arrow, the down arrow next to the plus sign, it's where I get this little fly out menu from. We can create a policy from an existing template like the United States Social Security number, one I showed you, uh, like one that uh, tracks uh, Australian bank routing numbers. There's a bunch of them in there, whatever they may be. Uh, by the way, there are a lot more of them available in the O365 Compliance Center than we see in the EAC here. So we have more depth in terms of those templates in O365. Just be aware of that. New policy from a custom template, which means I've created a policy using the third option down below, chosen to save it, and made it available so that I can then use it again repetitively. And that's where I get a custom template from, just so you understand the logic of that. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll just use an existing template just so we see what the options are. Fire that off, get a little creation window there. We'll give this a name. Let's call this Wes DLP Policy 1, just so we can track that, right? Hey there, Wes, for our description. All right. And you could see in terms of those templates, like I suggested to you, that there is a list here, and we could see what they are and see them here. And we have a few more, as I suggested, over in O365 compliance that may be available to us. But we have a pretty robust set of lists here. Now, I'll zoom in quickly. You may notice, I'll just kind of scroll up so we can see a few countries in there. All of these are coming from Microsoft, meaning they've created these and put them in. And they're all, almost without exception, driven by country-specific standards. Actually, they all are driven by country-specific standards currently, which is whether it's Japan in the window there, Saudi Arabia, the UK, the US down below, PCI DSS is a US thing, even though it doesn't say US, et cetera. These are regulatory and compliance standards that exist that we have templates around to drive stripping out of confidential data that would violate one or more of these regulations and prevent it from being sent. So that's where these come from, just so you understand the logic of that. And obviously, depending on the geographies you're working in, you don't have any exposure outside, let's say maybe the geography right around you, let's say hypothetically you're in Japan, and you don't have to worry about data going anywhere else, then you'd focus in on just the two or three that are there, but ignore the items for Israel, ignore the items for Saudi Arabia, the UK, et cetera, and just create one or more of these specific to your need. And there's two or three, hypothetically, right, for Japan. So you get the idea. Uh, and so we'll just go ahead and we'll say, oh, let's do, I don't know, where do you want to go today? Do uh, you want to do uh, foreign or you want to do something yeah, sure. local? Because uh, I was thinking PCI DSS, well, but if Foreign's you... local always somewhere. Local foreign. Okay, we'll do uh, Israel financial data. Israel financial data. Okay, so we're just going to highlight that yeah, one, perfect. whatever it may be. Sure. If you need to understand it, there's always a little explanation. Great, you go do that. This is the version number for the template that Microsoft's maintaining. Uh, and then... 
If you need more templates that you don't see here from partners, I'm zooming in on the bottom there, notice there is a link that says, hey, click here, learn more. There are third-party templates that you may be able to get access to. Some of them um, are going to have to be integrated based on you using certain products. So there's always that, how do we use those? How do we bring them in? How do we load them, et cetera? But you could go out and look for those if there's something specific that you may need. And then there is this more options area that we're going to click on in just a minute, this blue link, and see a couple of other things we want to be aware of here. So let me click there, and let me just pull this down. And we've seen these things already, but this is the enable, disable, enforce, test, with or without policy tips settings that we already saw. So we're going to go ahead, bring this policy up, but I'm going to disable it just because we don't have a reason to have it active right now. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click save. Okay, so we're just going to let that create. Takes a moment, doesn't take too long, but be patient with it. You'll see the little spinning please wait dialogue while it does its stuff. Don't close the window, by the way. Let it do its thing and wait for it to finish. I get this a lot. People say, oh, like everything else, I just close it, boom, I'm done. Yeah, you may wind up corrupting the creation process and have to start over. So uh, just give it time and be patient with it, okay? All right, so we're going to wait for that to finish. Now, while that's wrapping up, what we're gonna see as soon as this is done is that our policy will show up in the list there uh, below the policy that we currently have or above it, doesn't really matter. But that policy will be there. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just minimize this, let it finish just so we can kind of do something else. I wanna talk about managing policy tips since we spent some time on it. So while that policy is instantiating, because you can see right now it's not there yet, while it's doing that, let's click Manage Policy Tips and just bring up our dialog box here so we can see this. Now, the policy tip I showed you in the demo did not come from the policy that I have associated with the EAC here. As you can see, there are no policy tips here. Rather, it comes from the policy associated with O365 Security Compliance, where I have it set up and I've created, there it goes, the policy just popped in right down there, where I have a policy tip associated with it. I didn't create policy tips here for this policy because I wanted to show you we start out with none, and then we have to create them. Now, I could create them by going in, clicking the plus sign right there, as you can see. And this opens a separate window, so let's just bring this up. And I'm just going to pull down the little policy tip item there to show you my options, right, and show you that the information displayed to the sender down below, whatever I choose to do, is only going to be displayed when we create this, right? So we have to obviously have this before this works. Notify the sender is my option. Allow the sender to override. I mentioned we could just notify. That's the one I demonstrated for you. Allow us to override. The sender can get a button there that essentially lets them opt in and override and continues to send and will not block it. Block the message. That's the policy uh, specification I have operating in 0365 compliance. Or send a link in the policy tip to a compliance URL statement somewhere that the user has to understand and look at. So we have a Four different outcomes here, it's up to us, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say allow the sender to override. Locale just lets me choose the language that I wanna localize this into if I don't want it in the existing language or a different language, so that's what that does, right? And then the text, what is it that I actually want them to see? So, hey you, don't do that, right? Do this, my little homage to Madness, the band. All right, so uh, so I've done that, and I don't know, we'll uh, put that into Arabic or whatever language happens to be there. Okay, so I'm just going to click Save, and then our policy tip shows up and is obviously there. I can edit them, and I can do whatever I want with them. Okay, so now I have a policy tip uh, integrated just to show you how that works. Now, my policy was created. You can see the, way, the page has gone away. It closes on its own, and you'll see... I now have my policy available, and I can go in, as you can see, and I see whatever rules, just let that go. I have whatever rules uh, the Israeli financial data template that I pulled in has specified and teed up for me, so I could see them there. And you can see none of them are selected right now because, remember, I said disable the policy, so it's coming out of the box, not turned on. I'd have to go in and enable those if I want to use them. And I can go in, and you can see I could have different elements like we discussed available to us. And you'll see I can go ahead and pull in reporting. Now, there's no reporting available for this policy right now. 
but I have that option with that icon if I want to. And you'll see here, I can copy with the two sheets, the icon we're probably used to seeing for copy. I can copy this to make that custom template if I want to save this off, right? So we talked about all that. All right, so let's go in quickly and just wrap up our conversation in this area by looking at this reporting for a minute. I promised you I'd say a word about this, and I want to do that, but I also just want to show you right here how we can customize policy tips, right? We've already gone in and used the manage one up above, but if you click on that link, you'll see here, it takes us to the same place. I just want to show you that we can get to that from either location, either the link right here or this little icon does the same thing with policy tips. All right, so when we click here, this opens up a separate window. This is a little kludgy and clunky like I suggested to you. In my experience, number one, it sometimes will just pop right in and come up like this. Other times it doesn't come up. It just hangs, I have to close it out. I am sometimes prompted to log back in. Sometimes it will hang and I go out three or four times. It's not a consistent experience. It's one of the reasons I'm not real wild about this way of looking at the data through the EAC because it just doesn't seem, unfortunately, to operate as smoothly as it could be. And it's nowhere near as smooth an experience as it is over in the O365 Security Compliance Center. So I want you to see this, and we very well may not actually get anything at all because it sometimes happens, sometimes I suggested uh, it takes three or four attempts at this. Uh, but you'll see it's just kind of spinning. Some elements seem to be populating, others are not. And I found that, so I get a lot of queries and questions about this from customers. Hey, why can't we get this to come up? Why isn't it seamless? Why isn't it working? I wish I had a better answer then. You know, it's just not because obviously it's just really slow and it's just not uh, rendering, right, the way it should. Uh, but I'm not the one at Microsoft that gets to control that and says, I'll just go push the button and make sure it works for you, right? It just, unfortunately, I don't have that capability. So you could see as I'm going back in that it is taking time. It sometimes does that, by the way. That's I've seen that happen quite often as well. Uh, so I just want you to see that, unfortunately, it is not... Uh, the best part of this experience. One of the many reasons I like pushing DLP into O365 Security Compliance these days, because I can deal with Exchange there, but I also can deal with SharePoint, can deal with OneDrive, can deal with Teams, as we suggested, and get a much fuller experience that isn't going to really hamstring me and prevent me uh, from being able to see reporting and data management elements easily. And that's what we're experiencing here, right, as we're waiting on this to yet again, try to refresh. Now, when it does finally come up, we do have a nice interactive table that presents a visual graph that lets us see by clicking on the data points along the uh, happening line, if there are any, what happens. But even then, we just get a, a single line report on essentially the issue. We don't really get to drill down and see much in the way of data. And so it's not as great as what we get in the O365 experience. So I'm going to leave that to you to kind of Ferret out on your own if you do want to be patient enough to go in there three or four or five times to finally get to it. You'll see what it looks like. But you're going to see in the upcoming episode as we turn our attention over to the Security Compliance Center that I think you'll be happier with the way we display data there. All right, we've done everything we wanted to do with one exception. I'm going to call it out. We're going to push it into another episode. But I want you to see and understand this as we wrap up, which is this idea of managing document fingerprints. This is something most people are not aware of. They actually don't even think about and when they find out about it, they're like, wow, this may be really valuable for us. Uh, so document fingerprinting allows us to take forms and upload them if we're using them to capture sensitive data and have them incorporated as an element of the DLP policy and rule set so that when form-based data matching those forms is sent, we actually block it as well. It's a really cool feature, one that's often misunderstood and misrepresented in the sense people don't realize it's there. What's happened with this over time which is why I'm pointing it out to you before we talk about it in the next episode, is that you can't actually manage it from here. It's kind of a misleading link. We could see the outcomes of setting up document fingerprint um, elements, but it has to be done via the O365 Security Compliance Center because that's where all this is created now, and it's done via PowerShell, and I'm going to show you how to do it in the next episode. But we see the outcome of it here once it is set up. But if we try to go in and actually create one of them from here, while it looks like we can, we actually get an error when we finish the creation process. And it says, oh yeah, by the way, you no longer do it here. You got to do it through O365 Security and Compliance. So I'm going to show you how to populate these and ultimately how to use them. 
We're going to break that out and do a separate PowerShell-specific episode around that just to show you how you can deploy this really cool feature. All right, another great episode. We've got more to come in Microsoft Exchange Online, so come, uh, come back and join us as we continue this journey. Adam, thank you so much for being here with us as always, and we appreciate you, the viewer, watching. Signing out for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Wes Bryan. Uh, that makes me Adam Gordon. That does, and we'll see you next time. That's me. <laughs>